Radioactive decay is random, but because there's so many atoms in any given sample of any substance, we can actually predict exactly how many will have decayed in any given period of time. And that's because there's a certain probability of any individual nucleus decaying in any given second. So because we have these large numbers, we can actually measure how many are likely to decay after any given period of time. We use something called the half-life. The half-life is the average time taken for the number of nuclei of an isotope in a sample or the activity or the count rate to half. Now just take that in for a moment. The half-life is the time taken for something to half. That's a really key point about this. That's why I've emboldened that word. The half-life is the average time it takes for a number to half. It is not what is half the number, which is an often confused thing that people get. Lots of people think that after two half-lives, then all of the atoms must be gone, for example. That's a misunderstanding that a lot of people have. After one half-life, you'd have half the number left. After two half-lives, you'd have a quarter. After three, you'd have an eighth, and so on. It just keeps halving every single half-life. Now, with half-life calculations, you just need to, first of all, calculate how many half-lives have passed. Now, either that's because you're starting with a number and you're told how many are left, you're told what the overall decay is or because they've started you with a, a time that's passed and they've told you how long each half-life is. Whatever you're starting with, you start by working out how many half-lives are passed and you work out the other thing. So you're either working number of nuclei and working out how long is passed or you've been given how long is passed and you're working out how many nuclei are left. But the step in the middle is always going to be to work out how many half-lives have passed. Typically, this is going to be displayed on graphs like this. Now, these two graphs are different, but they are for the same event. This graph on the left shows the number of undecayed dice, because this is with a dice model. And the number on the right shows the actual number of dice that decay every turn. But you can see the pattern is the same. And actually, when we use interpolation, that's what these red little dotted lines mean, we actually get the same value for the time taken for whatever that number is to half. So all you need to use when you're given a graph like this and asked to use it to determine the half-life, you just need to use this skill of interpolation by taking whatever the y-intercept is, halving it, going across to the line and then down to the x-axis and reading off the time taken for that value to half. That's the half-life. The graphs are exactly the same, but it shows you hopefully that it doesn't matter whether you're using number or whether you're using activity, you should get the same half-life. These are using dice to model the random nature of radioactive decay. So we can use anything that has a certain probability to model the way that large numbers of radioactive nuclei decay. Because they, just like a dice, they have a certain probability of decaying each second. They are completely random, just like rolling a dice. Now in the higher tier, you need to know how to use what's called net decline. That's not really that challenging, I think. It's, it's just the ratio of remaining nuclei. So rather than give you a number of nuclei, they're going to just ask you for the ratio or to use the ratio. So if I just take a little table of how many half-lives are passed, the net decline is just that fraction that are left. After one half-life, you've got a half. After two half-lives, you've got a quarter. After three half-lives, an eighth. Four half-lives, a sixteenth five half-lives are 32, and six half-lives are 64. That is just one over two to the power of the number of half-lives that have passed.